scripture for this evening is Psalms 119, 169 through 176. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. Let my lips utter praise, for you teach me your status. Let my tongue sing of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, that is my praise, you and let your ordinances help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Well, this is our last night as we, can, as we finish up our study on how to be a better student of the Bible. You know, I think one of the problems when we talk about studying the Bible is, uh, well, we don't, oftentimes we don't know how to study, but I, I think really it comes down to, I don't know where to begin. You know, studying is something we can learn to do, but sometimes it's hard to know where to start. Uh, the Bible's a big book. It's understandable. I, I don't think that's a poor excuse at all. It's a big book. It's... There's a lot of topics covered about across the whole spectrum of life. And so it is difficult sometimes to find exactly where I want to start, where I want to begin in studying it. Um, you know, I want to suggest a few ways that we can approach this. Uh, a few ways that not only are they good ways to approach it and kind of give us a starting place in our study based on maybe what interests us in, in, in certain ways, uh, but will also then um, enable us to move forward. And I'm going to give some illustrations of these as we go along. First of all, you can study your Bible in part by studying the words. You know, the, the words are important uh, that, that we have in the Scriptures. Word studies can be very helpful. And oftentimes, if we take time to study a particular word um, that might be in a verse that we're looking at, we can uh, find some hidden truths, shed some light on the passage that maybe we would not have otherwise. Now... I would not suggest when I talk about doing a word study, I'm not talking about pulling out your Webster's Dictionary. Uh, that's not where we're going to get the definitions that we need uh, because oftentimes Webster's Dictionary is very culturally uh, apply, you know, compliant to the things that are going on in our world today and words may mean something in that book that they don't mean in the Bible. Um, but I would suggest that you get a, uh, a Greek Hebrew Dictionary, a Strong's, uh, which has been around forever, and, and probably there's probably online versions of that if you if that's if that's what you want to do. Um, one of the best word study books for people and their studies for just quick and and quick way to understand words is the Vines, uh, Vines Dictionary. Uh, it has words from the Bible and will tell you what the original language words are and uh, kind of give you the different definitions that go along with that and the way that they're translated. Um, so, you know, I think those are things that would help in any type of study like this. Let me give you a few examples of where understanding the words kind of helps us or gives us kind of a, a greater understanding of the text. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, one of those trustworthy statements. Paul says, It is a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office of overseer. It is a fine work that he desires to do. I want to think about two words here, that word aspires and that word desires, because they're not the same word. They're not really saying the same thing when we, when we consider them in the original language. When we look at that aspires, it is literally to strive for. There is an action in that word. So it's not just wanting the office of elders. It's not, I, I want to be an elder. It is striving to make my life a life that can fulfill that role, that can meet those qualifications. So there's action in that. Striving hard to do that is the idea behind that word, aspiring to be an elder. And so, you know, it's not like some, you know, it's not something that you go one day and go, I guess I'll be an elder. Now, it, you know, there's the idea in what Paul is saying here is that the man has been preparing himself for this. It's not an overnight thing, it, or it's not a just today thing. It is a thing that has been going on from some time within him. 
And so when we understand that, uh, you know, we see a much different idea. My dad actually sat in a, in a meeting in, in the, this would have been in the 60s, and they were talking about appointing elders, and they started going down the line asking the guys if they wanted to be elders. And one of the guys said, well, never much thought about it, but sure, why not? That's not aspiring uh, to the office of an elder. So we have the word aspire. And then we have the word desire. It is a fine work he desires to do. Desires, there is a strong desire. And it, you know, it, it's, that, it's something that is very important. Now, that word can also have a negative connotation. It's used at times in regard to uh, greed, the desire for money. And so you can see that there is a powerful drive in the person to want to, ha- want to be that, uh, serve in that particular role uh, in the church. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, another example, says, Brethren, if anyone is, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. That word restore there, and it's kind of an uh, industrial kind of word there, restore. You know, we think about fixing, you know, f- fixing furniture, right? Restoring a, a piece of furniture or something like that. But I like the way the word is used in another place, and this is one of those values you get because when you look at how the same word might be used somewhere else in the Scripture, sometimes you get an even better idea of what's being said. In Matthew chapter 4, in verse 21, it says, Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Now, you know, we probably would just read through that. That's the story that we know well, right? Jesus' call uh, to, to them there on the Sea of Galilee. But he talks about what they were doing. They were mending their nets. The same word, by the way that Galatians chapter 6 uses. And so that kind of gives us this even more powerful idea of what's being said there. That when your brother is caught in a trespass, his, you know, his life is torn, his spiritual life is torn, that you'll mend it. You'll help him mend that life. You know, just like they were mending those nets that day. There's a, there's a very personal aspect to that idea, isn't there, compared to the idea of just restore there is this idea of hands-on, let me help you get your life mended back together. I, I think that that really gives us a, a better insight as to uh, how we help the brokenness of, of people's lives. And, and that, 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 that idea of mending is very powerful indeed. You know, there is one other that we can consider, and, and we kind of see it throughout the Scriptures. There's a several different Greek words used, but for the most part... It, it is the word wine. And that comes from the word onyos. And onyos, you need to understand in the original language, folks, I, I know when we say the word wine in the English, and this is why Webster's don't do you any good, when we say wine, we are talking about alcoholic wine. That's not always the case with the Bible. And that needs to be understood because people, I've heard people, I've sat and had discussions with people, they go, but it says wine. Yeah, it, it's translated wine. Not the same thing. Uh, onios can mean everything from grape juice that we put in these that was onios this morning that we had in our Lord's Supper all the way up to that which is alcoholic so we need to understand that in context oftentimes defines what the Bible is dealing with in regard to those things so you know when we study that we come to understand that just because the word is what we perceive it to be as something alcoholic does not mean that that is what it's actually yeah, trying to say within Scripture. So that's another example. I better move on. If I keep giving examples there, I'm not going to get to any of the others. So you study the words. Well, let's take it up a little bit more. Study verses. Verses in the Bible. You know, I, I, I'm not advocating here, and we have to be careful. We don't want to ascribe to one-verse theologies. In other words, where we build our entire Christian life on a singular verse, out, you know, whether it's in context or you know, whatever. People have done that all of their lives. They've taken John 3.16 and made it where all you have to do is believe and nothing else. And so they've created a one-verse theology out of that beautiful verse there in John 3.16. So we, we don't want to do that. But there are, many Bible, there are many verses in the Bible that do stand alone, that do give us encouragement. 
You know, as we think about them, John 3.16 is certainly one of them if we understand it in the light of the rest of Scripture. You know, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. You know, those kind of things that give us inspiration for the day, those things that kind of give us encouragement, uh, we can learn those kind of verses and put those into our hearts and remind, you know, bring those verses to bear on our lives on days when it's difficult. If you have a problem in your life, find some verses. Um, You know, even if you want to, you know, go to your Bible. Let me tell you this, if if you struggle... Go to your Bible and find verses that encourage you. Find 30 of them. And every day, read one. And just keep doing those 30 every day until you memorize them. And then find you 30 more. I promise you won't, have, you won't run out. But use those as scriptures. I, I used to call those victory scriptures, things that help us, remind, reminds us that we can have victory every single day. But learn those verses. Put them to your heart. And they will most certainly help you. Uh, But be careful. Some verses we need to understand cannot be understood um, outside without or without the context that is ultimately around them. Let me give you an example of that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 8. Let's just say that I use just this verse. We're not going to read anything else from this. I'm just going to take this verse at face value, okay, with no context. Paul says... I robbed other churches <laughs> by taking wages from them to serve you. <laughs> Paul, you're a scoundrel, right? You're a thief. I robbed churches. But really what he's saying when you read the whole of it is Paul saying, I, I didn't take money from you, Corinth. I took it from, I allowed other churches to help me. And, you know, Paul says, I almost feel like I robbed them. Uh, but they were giving the money to him freely. He just did not take any from Corinth. And so, you know, when we see that in the larger context, it makes a little more sense. You know, also, uh, you can analyze verses and really find great lessons out of them. In fact, uh, one of the things we teach, such as in preacher's camp, is taking a verse, analyzing it, and you can make an entire sermon out of the points that you find in particular verses within Scripture. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So we look at that, and we can, we can break that down. Upon this rock, so we can think about the foundation of the Lord's church, upon that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We can see that he says, I will build, or I So there's a builder, and it's Jesus. He is the builder of the church. We can see that he he says we'll build, that there is time and there is action. He's going to happen in the future, but he's going to do it. And the action is going to be resting in him. We see that he says my, my church, right? So he shows possession, that the church belongs to him. And then he says that the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And so he gives us the certainty of it always existing, the everlasting kingdom. Folks, you can break that verse down like that, and then you can sit there and flesh those different points out and go all over the Scriptures in regard to the Lord's church. And so it will guide your study. It will give you a place to begin and then flow out from from there. Another verse real quick is Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Paul says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. So here we see that Paul's talking about the kind of people we are. What kind of people are we? We're redeemed people. We are pure people. We are possessed people. We are people that are zealous for good works. So what kind of people are members of the church? Well, that one verse gives us some pretty powerful indicators of who we are and you can set and then you can study those particular ideas one at a time and build upon your understanding of scripture so we can study by word we can study verses let's take let's come up a little bit more you can study by chapter um you know there are exceptions but mostly most of the time chapters of the bible notify us of breaks in the writer's thoughts or subjects. Men, 
put chapters in. Chapters aren't inspired, okay? So there are instances where a chapter kind of is thrown in a weird place and might cut off a thought or put a, put, put a chapter break in a, in a thought that continues on. Um, but for the most part, uh, they are very useful in that regard. So, you know, label your chapters. Like when you study the Bible, look, at, read a chapter as a whole first and go, what is this, what's kind of the, the overall idea being talked about in this chapter? And write that. Do your own as you study and write those above those chapters in your Bible. Uh, my dad would get very upset at me for me telling you to write in your Bible, but uh, <laughs> he never did uh, like writing in his Bible. But uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you think about if you begin to know what the chapters are in the Bible, then you're going to quickly be able to go to things uh, if you kind of begin to get this understanding. You know, Genesis 1, there's the creation. Genesis 3 is the fall of man. You can kind of, Genesis 6, the beginning of the flood. You can kind of, you know, begin to understand and see. You know, you go to Exodus chapter 20, and you have the giving of the law. Acts chapter 2, we understand that's the, the first gospel sermon, the beginning of the Lord's church. Second Peter chapter 3 is the second coming of Christ. See, when we begin to understand those things, if somebody asks you about the second coming of Christ, you can jump right there. You can go, Second Peter 3 is about that. Right? And so this helps you in your study and also helps you as you may discuss things with other people, but kind of get these broad ideas. You know, when we look at uh, John, uh, you, you can kind of almost do John by characters, by who's involved. You know, chapter, chapter 1 you have, I mean, you can pick any of them, any of the first disciples that are there at the end of that chapter. You know, whether it's Peter, Andrew, uh, John or Philip, or Bartholomew. You, you can pick any of those as, as those guys that are first called by Jesus there in John chapter 1. You know, 2 is the, the wedding feast at Cana, so you can think about Mary. She was there. Uh, 3 is Nicodemus. 4 is the woman at the well, right? Jump over to 9, you get the blind man. 11 is Lazarus. So see, you can kind of take the people that are in these chapters and kind of make that a memory crutch to remind you of what's going on in the book of John. And you can do that with a lot of books. And so I would encourage you to kind of look at things by, by chapter. And last of all, you can study by the book as a whole. And, and that's absolutely necessary. Um, you know, we talk about all these things, we divide them up, but ultimately at the end of the day we want to get the whole message uh, of what's being given. And it's necessary if we're going to get that overall understanding of the passages within various books of the Bible for us to look at it as a as a whole. Um, Studying the entirety of the book uh, will help us learn its overall purpose. I will give you advice that was given to me in beginning preaching class uh, (laughs) 32 years ago. Uh, Brother David Underwood said, Brethren, if you're going to study a book, he said, read it in one sitting. In other words, if you're going to study Matthew or you're going to study Acts or whatever it may be, sit down and read that in one sitting. When we, when we read a chapter today and we read a chapter tomorrow, we lose a lot between those, between those two reading times. But if you sit down, and I, and I kind of doubted, you know, <laughs> at my age at that time, I kind of doubted that what he was saying meant anything. I was like, wow, that sounds like a lot of work to have to read, sit down and read in one sitting. And, and, you know, even the longest books won't take you more than 20 minutes or so. But... I sat down and I did that with the book of Acts, uh, which was another class I was taking with him, the same man. And I read it all in one sitting, and, and I, connections were made that I never had made before as I because it was fresh. I just read what was in the last chapter. Now I'm reading a different chapter. And I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. That ties to what I just read. And so it made a big difference. So I would encourage you to do that if you're going to be studying. Uh, one of the finest Christian men I ever knew um, growing up Brother Frank Lynch, humble, quiet man with incredible Bible knowledge. He was a Marine on Guadalcanal in World War II, so he was a man that had seen some some pretty horrific things, and yet he knew he was nothing but kind and compassionate to people. But whatever my dad was studying in the auditorium, say he was studying Romans on Sunday morning, and say he was studying 1 Corinthians on Wednesday night, Brother Frank Lynch read that entire book for both, both books every single day for as long as my dad taught. My dad makes me look fast, okay? 
That gives you the idea of how long he might have been reading the same book over and over, but I guarantee you every time he read it, he learned something more. And so, you know, I'd encourage you uh, to think on those kind of lines. Well, when you're thinking about the book as a whole, you want to kind of find the purpose. Some books make it easy for you. Some books give it to you. Folks, when you read, I am writing because, (laughs) jump on that verse. Mark that verse because the writer is telling you why he's writing the book. And, and John does that for us. The book of John, if you look in John chapter 20, and verses 30 and 31, he says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Here it is. But these have been written. There it is. John said, I'm writing these, and this is the reason. Get it. But these have been written that you, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. John says, Jesus did a lot of things. He did a lot of miracles. But he says, I have given you these. I have, I have written these down so that you can believe, so that you can know for a certainty that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want you to understand that. That's what the book's about. It's about Jesus being divine. That's why you see Jesus giving those I am statements. That's why he begins with the very first verse talking about the Word and God, right? Together. One. Because that's what the whole book's about. When you understand that, you begin to look at it with those eyes. You begin to look at it and see, how is John showing me here that Jesus is God? uh, But he, he tells you that. Paul also does that at times. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, Paul tells Timothy, I am writing these things. There you go. Let me tell you why. I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come, before you, uh, come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and supporter of truth. Paul says, I'm writing to you so that you know how to live in the church. You looked at 1 Timothy lately? Chapter 3, elders, deacons, appointment of those guys. How do we function as the Lord's church? Chapter 2, how the ladies ought to be. How older, you know, throughout the book, older women, younger women, older men, younger men, all how we function as the Lord's church together. And Paul says, that's why I'm writing. Do you know how to conduct yourself? as a part of the Lord's church. See, understanding that, then you look at Timothy, 1 Timothy in that light, and you begin to draw the truths that Paul was intending for us to understand. You know, we can also think about Philippians and uh, how that we obtain joy through our giving of ourselves to others. And, uh, and when, you, when you look at it with those eyes, then you see it on every page and in every chapter. And so... You know, look at the books, find what their overall purpose is, and then continue to study with that understanding, and you will plumb deep into the depths of what uh, understanding God's Word by doing that. You know, I think that every Christian should be serious about being people that know God's Word. It used to be an old joke back last century that... The Church of Christ knew their Bible so well. The members of the Church of Christ knew their Bible so well that one time in court, they couldn't find a Bible to swear on, so they brought a Church of Christ member up and put their hands on him, right? That was a joke. But there was a reason why that was a joke. You didn't just pick Church of Christ members out out and go, let's just make fun of them for knowing the Bible. No, it's a joke because they knew their Bibles. And people didn't like that, (laughs) so they made a joke about it. And and so there certainly was a a time when we knew our Scriptures very well as as church in general, and and yet we can still be that today if only we'll apply ourselves to it and be that. And we know the Scriptures well enough that somebody put their hand on us, I guess. Uh, that's, not, that's not a bad thing to ascribe to and to try to have in our lives. 
But you cannot know what to be as a Christian. You cannot know how to live this life for God until you read how He says to do it. doesn't matter what Nathan thinks. doesn't matter what Doug thinks. doesn't matter what uh, Aaron or Daniel thinks. It only matters what God says. And that's how we become His children. That's how we plant this seed in our lives. And it's the only seed that grows a Christian. I hope that you give yourself to it. There is so much to know here. There's, there's so much to learn here. And it can be exciting if you'll only invest your life in it. Invest some time in it. It's got to be more than five minutes while you're about half asleep and getting ready to go to bed. It's going to be times when you sit down at the table with your markers, uh, with your pens, and you write in there and you kind of keep up with it. But you give time to it. Where you look at resources, you buy resources for it, as we talked about before in this series. But it is important to know this book. And everything rides on it. Because your faith will never rise above your knowledge of what's in here. If we're going to have strong faith, you're going to have to have strong knowledge. And I hope that you dedicate your life to that. This evening, if you're not a child of God, we hope and pray that you make the decision to become one in the manner in which God has said to do it here. If you're a child of God, maybe you haven't been living as you should. Maybe, you haven't been, maybe it's because you haven't been studying like you should. Decide today to change. And to do that, going forward, and grow your faith and be what God would have you to be. If we can help you with that this evening, we'll break you a lettuce. Why don't you come as we stand over?